Okay, it's going to be a review of WWF Backlash 1999, the first ever Backlash. Uh, so we got WrestleMania Backlash coming up on May 8th. Hopefully it's a much more consistent show than uh, WrestleMania, but we'll see what happens. But that's WrestleMania Backlash. So this, this is the very first Backlash. I think Backlash has got to be the coolest sounding uh, pay-per-view title. And uh, I, I like the spot that it's in. Uh, right after WrestleMania, the Backlash to WrestleMania. I'm just not a big fan of putting WrestleMania right before the Backlash title. I think it sounds kind of corny, but I, I get why they're doing it. But yeah, very historical show here. We're going all the way back to April 25th, 1999. I said I hated 2008, but 99 is probably my favorite year, you know, just from a personal standpoint, not really for wrestling. But, uh, but yeah, we're going all the way back to the Providence Civic Center, in Providence, Rhode Island, not a very uh, big venue, kind of a smaller arena. The attendance was only 10,939. This is where they ran Royal Rumble 1994. I think they, they had uh, Armageddon 2004, the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view with uh, Taker and Orton. This the very same venue here. Uh, the pay-per-view buy rate was only 400,000. Which is good, actually. You know, for 99, I think I think that's a solid number. It's just half of what WrestleMania was and, and not quite as good as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre or even the very uh, tragic uh, Over the Edge pay-per-view the very next month. But yeah, this th this was definitely a good decision to cash in on Rock versus Austin before they turn Rock babyface. So I, I think that was definitely the right call. Um, so you got a rematch to the WrestleMania 15 main event. Uh, some interesting side notes here. This was the very, this was actually being promoted as a in your house, but but it it seems to me as they uh, progress towards the pay per view, they actually dropped the in your house branding uh, leading up to the show. So no more in your houses after Backlash uh, 1999, and uh, tragically, this was actually Owen Hart's last pay per view. So it looks like Owen didn't wrestle at the UK pay per view. Uh, no Mercy in, in May of 99. And then, you know, we all know what happened at Over the Edge, uh, 1999. But, um, yeah, let's get right into it. Very first match of the night. We got the Ministry of Darkness. So these were the, the Ministry of Darkness was the Undertaker's uh, stable here. We have Farouk Bradshaw and Midian. Uh, taking on the brood of Gangrel, Edge, and Christian six-man tag match. I I, th I thought this was okay. Um, you know, the, the, this definitely had some some good links, and then you had some really really uh, weak links as well. I would say Midian and, and Gangrel kind of brought this match down. Uh, great experience for Edge and Christian. I think this this might have been one of the first time you've seen Edge and Christian wrestle uh, on a pay per view. Uh, so the story behind the match was. I believe Christian actually ratted out that Stephanie, where Stephanie was, because at this time Undertaker was trying to abduct Stephanie and, and sacrifice her. So this is during that whole time. So so they blame Christian for actually ratting them out. So this that's why the two teams are facing here. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, Farouk and Bradshaw, at the time, they had the Ministry of Darkness tattoos on them. I would definitely say they look good. This definitely looked like the most athletic version of the a APA I think you had seen up to that point. Christian was, his attire was a little weird. He was trying to wear this oversized, like, white dress shirt. Uh, I thought Edge was probably the, the best worker in this whole match here. But, you know, it, 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 I think one of the things that stands out about the pay-per-view is it was just tough to sit through. I, I think it felt like a lot of these matches got too much time. Um, there was no video packages for any match besides the main event. So you really just had like a lot of extra time for a lot of the matches that you just didn't give a shit about. But... um yeah, the match is okay. The, the match actually ends when Viscera comes out and screws uh, the Brood out of this match. And Viscera would actually, you know, I think this is the first time you've seen him as Viscera, uh, as Mabel transforming to Viscera. Uh, so, yeah, so there we go with that. Not, not, not a great opener, but definitely not the weakest thing on the show. Okay, next up for the Hardcore Championship, we got Al Snow with Head. Taking on Hardcore Holly. Hardcore Holly is actually the Hardcore Champion. And once again, this is another match that just got a lot of time. Uh, so they started off in the ring. Then they went into the garage. Then they went to the parking lot. They they found themselves actually you know, trying to pin each other in a garbage dump. 
Uh, and then, you know, there was a lot of boring chance when they were, you know, kind of, uh, you know, fighting back through the garage. You know, they they really punished each other. The, the funny thing is Al Snow and Hardcore Holly, you know, you think of both guys as, you know, trainers from Tough Enough. And then when you look at what they did in this match, you know, there's really nothing you can learn from them from a wrestling standpoint here. Everything here was just, you know, trying to, you know, use weapons or, or, or use foreign objects to, 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 hurt, to hurt each other here. So that's pretty much what it was. Now, they did have some memorable stuff in their feud. I, I think they actually uh, had a hardcore match in the uh, Mississippi River at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So this is kind of like the blow-off to the whole thing here. So they, they go through 15 minutes of just, you know, going everywhere throughout this whole arena. And then it ends with Al Snow using the head to get the victory here. So I, I'll give both guys credit. I thought they busted their ass. You know, they, they definitely went through a lot of pain. It's just uh, from a wrestling standpoint, it just it just wasn't pretty. And you know, there there were parts in the match where the the fans are really getting getting on them, um, you know. But uh, but let's move on to the next match. We have the Intercontinental Championship match. You got the Godfather taking on Goldust. I would definitely say this is the weakest thing of the night. Uh, you know, the it, the Godfather took forever to bring out the hose. Uh, the fans are going crazy for the hose. Jerry Lawler really. Uh, acting like a dirty old man, kind of, um, you know, f going crazy for this one redhead. This one redhead had really big natural tits and a really nice ass. And, uh, you know, Jerry was just like salivating over her. And, uh, yeah, so the, the you have that whole thing with the hose there. And then the blue meanie is in Goldust Corner. And uh, he was kind of annoying. He was kind of being a nuisance throughout the whole match. And this is just attitude era crap. This is something you could have seen on Raw. Uh, definitely wasn't a big fan of it. It, it. it just, it just, one of those things where it just felt, if you took away the hose, like the fans just did not give a shit about the Godfather. It definitely came off like that. So yeah, we're kind of off to a weak start here. Uh, next match, we got the New Age Outlaws of uh, the Road Dog and Billy Gunn uh, taking on Owen Hart and Jeff Jarrett with Deborah. And this is a tag team match to determine the number one contenders for the tag team championship. Okay, I actually thought the match was actually really good. Uh, I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, the crowd ruined the match, though. So when Deborah comes out, she comes out like a stripper. She really does. I mean, she's got the, the big tits. You know, she, she looks like she just came out of the Showgirls uh, movie or whatever, you know. And uh, the whole match, the, the, the crowd is chanting, Show your puppies! You know, you know, this is kind of like the like an a rock, you know, Hogan crowd reaction for Deborah. I mean, they were they were going crazy. Uh, they were just relentless. This this has got to be the horniest crowd I've ever seen. When you combine Jerry Lawler's commentary with the actual crowd, they um, yeah, it, it's just that that that's what it was in 1999. That that this is this is what it was back in the Attitude Era. So Deborah. Totally took away from the match. I mean, Deborah looked hot. Don't get me wrong. I, th I thought she looked amazing. You could see why Austin was uh, attracted to Deborah and why they got married. You know, Austin was making more money than anybody in the company. You know, you could definitely argue in 99, Deborah was the hottest thing that they had. But the funny thing is, when Deborah was with Austin, you know, she was never showcased like this again. And maybe maybe that's why. It definitely took away from the match. And I, th I thought the match was actually good. You know, Owen and Jarrett, there was a simultaneous figure four and sharpshooter that they busted out. I thought uh, Billy Gunn was really good here. He got a hot tag. The the girls were going crazy for Billy Gunn at this time. I, I totally forgot about that. You know, they, they really... Like when when Billy showed his ass or when he took off his shirt, the girls are going crazy for the for the Billy Gunn hot tag. So this is probably one of the more over sequences I've seen Billy Gunn. You know, maybe that's why he won King of the Ring. You know, like a, a performance like this. He was in one bright spot in the match. So I thought the match was a lot of fun. I just felt like the crowd, you know, with them salivating over Deborah's, Deborah's tits the whole match, it, it kind of took, it really took away from the match. It, it just felt like the match was secondary. That's just how it came off there. So, but yeah, the match was actually a lot of fun if you could just ignore the crowd. Uh, okay, next up we got Mankind taking on the Big Show, uh, another WrestleMania rematch. This is a uh, boiler room brawl. And it, it was good. It, it didn't go too long. Uh, they learned from the mistakes that they made at the SummerSlam 96 uh, boiler room brawl. Uh, if, if you remember, there was a lot of technical difficulties. I'm not sure if a lot of that was done on purpose or, or maybe they wanted it to feel like that. But it was just very dark. It was hard to see a lot of stuff. Here, the lighting was great. 
it, it just felt like the lighting was super sharp. You could see everything. I thought Mankind and Big Show, they busted their ass for the amount of time that, that it went. When the match first started, I was just like, oh, my God, I, I do not want to sit through a boiler room brawl because I, I forgot about this. I didn't know we were going to get another one of these matches because it felt very similar to the hardcore match where you're just seeing two guys beat each other up all over the arena, but this was actually good. You know, Foley took some nasty bumps. He got cut, up, cut open by the glass. They were using these, you know, wooden boards, all these different, you know, uh, glass objects. And uh, yeah, I mean, lots of different weapons. They both went through a lot of punishment. Big Show had to get stitched up. Now, to win this match, you actually had to... Um, you didn't have to go to the ring. All you had to do was escape through a door. So Teddy Long is, you know, right next to this door. And if you if you escape the boiler room, you officially won the match. So that's how it ended. Okay, next up we got Triple H with China taking on X Pac. Huge match for Triple H. So uh, so Triple H actually turned heel at WrestleMania, and uh, you know that was the end of Degeneration X. And he he sided with the corporation, both him and China. So huge, huge match for Triple H. This is his first, you know, pay-per-view match as a heel at this, you know, in 1999. This, this is definitely kind of, kind of like The Rock. Like I, I would say, th this is a huge weekend for Triple H and The Rock because this is Triple H's first pay-per-view match as a heel for this heel turn. And then the very next night on Raw, you know, Rock was turning babyface. So this 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 is a huge change of direction for both Triple H and The Rock. And when you see where both guys were the very next year, you know, they transformed themselves and, you know, they, they were really clicking on all cylinders. So this was ju just definitely the start of something new for both guys. Um, so, yeah, Triple H was kind of blaming X-Pac, you know, saying, you know, that he owned X-Pac. And if it wasn't for him, you know, Degeneration X wouldn't exist. You know, that type of storyline. But at this particular time, Triple H was still trying to find it. If you look at the ring attire, you, you, you listen to the entrance theme, you know, just a lot still needed to be done. It, it kind of felt more like the Triple H from 98, the mid-carter, than the Triple H from Backlash 2000, for example. Uh, but yeah, I, th I thought the match was good, though. Uh, this is considered one of the best pay-per-view matches of 1999. This actually got more time than any other match on the show, just a little bit under 20 minutes. I got to say, though, the thing that really disappointed me here was the support that X-Pac got. You know, X-Pac is more of a high flyer and um, playing the baby face here. And it just just seemed like the fans really weren't into him. You know, the, the really the, 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 the part in the match where the fans got behind him was when Kane came out. So Kane came out to get his revenge. Fans started going crazy. And then really no interference. It just, X-Pac was allowed to do a couple of Bronco Busters and the fans kind of got behind him there. But for the most part, I got to say, the fans really weren't into X-Pac uh, for whatever the reason. But, uh, but I thought Triple H was good here. You know, this, you know, turning heel, you could see he was able to dictate the tempo. He was able to control the match. He went to work on X-Pac's neck. Did a lot of... Um, you know, sleeper holds, lots, lots of neck breakers, lots of good, lots of good submission work from Triple H. I, I don't think Triple H looked like he was in his prime quite yet. Still, like a lot of work needed to be done. China was a nuisance at ringside. She definitely uh, interfered here. The, the the Jerry Lawler did have a, a good line though, because you know they were talking about Deborah's puppies, but here he said, you know, China's those aren't puppies, those are pit bulls. So I actually thought that was a pretty creative line. But uh, but yeah, Kane Kane got screwed at WrestleMania. So he got his revenge on Triple H. So the, the fans went crazy for Kane. Uh, but ultimately, uh, X-Pac takes his eye off the ball after doing the Bronco Buster to China. And then Triple H hits him with the pedigree. But Triple H did, a, did get a lot of heat on the pedigree, though. So I'll give, I'll give it up to Triple H there. But that, that's kind of one of the things you'll notice about Triple H matches. Like whenever you take your, your focus off of... Um, off of Triple H, you know, who always hit you with that pedigree. So it, it's one of those things that always made his matches so dramatic. I remember a perfect example of of this would be the the uh, the Benoit match of Vengeance 2004 when, when Eugene was in there. And I, I just remember everyone at the pay-per-view party saying, you know, don't take your focus away. Triple H is right behind you. What are you thinking? I, th I think it was Benoit who was trying to make sure that Eugene was okay and, you know, Triple H was about to bust him with the pedigree. So, that yeah, that that's definitely one of the things that uh, 
that you notice about Triple H matches. Like if, if you take your focus away from him, he'll nail you with the pedigree and then game over. So, uh, yeah, but I, I thought Triple H and X-Pac was really, really good stuff. Um, the, the match was long, so it, it just kind of felt like it dragged at certain points. But, but definitely, they got a lot of time out there. They told a good story. And, um, yeah, kind of really set the tone for, for Triple H's heel turn. So I say it was good, but not great. You know, it, it really, it, it's a lot higher than three and a half. But I, I can't say it's, um, I'd be lying if I said it hit the four-star level. Uh, okay, <laughs> next up, we got The Undertaker taking on Ken Shamrock. Woo! Yeah, with Taker and Shamrock. I got to say, I liked what I saw here. I, there was a lot to like. And um, it really felt like at this time, you know, Taker uh, had a little bit more freedom. You know, he, he really took this Ministry of Darkness character and it, it felt like he really put his own twist on it. He, it was very dark. Uh, and with this match here with Shamrock, it really felt like he had a lot of creative control here to kind of have the match that he wanted you know one of the criticisms about undertaker matches is that they just felt like vince really controlled the character it just felt very robotic but here he kind of went away from it but maybe that was part of vince's fear that he didn't want to humanize taker because maybe because you know maybe from time to time you get reactions like this and it just seemed like the fans just didn't give a fuck uh, about the actual match you heard a lot of boring chants um, very unappreciative uh, crowd here. I, I was not a big fan of this crowd. To me, they reeked of just a very spoiled, just very, you know, bloodthirsty kind of, uh, you know, it's a Vince Russo crowd. You know, the type of crowd that was into Jerry Springer, Crash TV, that type of crowd. No appreciation for good wrestling. Shamrock was great here. He busted out some really nice leg locks, some really nice transitions. I'll tell you what, man. If you like Taker versus Angle from No Way Out 2006, I, I think you really like this match. You know, there, there's a lot of similarities there, you know, with, uh, you know, Shamrock actually countering the, the tombstone into the ankle lock. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't quite as, you know, spectacular as the as some of the stuff that they pulled off in the No Way Out 2006 match with Angle and Taker. But there's there's really a lot to like. I, I think even the choke slam into the, uh, the choke slam into the uh, into an arm bar from Shamrock. That was really cool. You know, the fans really started to get behind Shamrock once he busted out the belly to belly. But once again, a very horny crowd. They're chanting for Ryan Shamrock. I mean, you have to go back to some of the Raws to remember Ryan Shamrock, uh, uh, Ken Shamrock's sister. Apparently she was really hot. And I guess Taker tried to abduct her, you know, the same way with, with Stephanie. So they're actually chanting, we want Ryan during the match. So totally, totally disrespecting a lot of the good you know, technical work that they were doing. You know, obviously, Taker is a big fan of MMA. Obviously, that's part of the reason why he put over Brock and he was so generous to Kurt Angle. I think the only guy Taker tapped out to was Kurt Angle in 2002, if I'm not mistaken. So, so yeah, I thought the match was really good. You know, uh, Bradshaw actually comes out to interfere, but ultimately, Taker, Taker pretty much gets a clean victory with the tombstone on Ken Shamrock. So, I'll give it up to both guys. I thought both guys were good. Next up, we got... A no-holds-barred match for the WWF Championship with Shane McMahon as a special guest referee. So we got Austin, Stone Cold Steve Austin, taking on The Rock. This is the rematch from WrestleMania. So The Rock is the WWF... Er, the, Austin is the WWF Champion. But The Rock ends up with the Smoking Skull title. Vince actually, you know, kind of kidnapped the Smoking Skull title uh, from Austin and... Uh, Said he was never going to have it again. Eventually, The Rock actually shows up with the Smoking Skull title. They did some really fun things here. They, they, this had to be some of the funnest buildup to, to any Rock versus Austin feud. Um, it, it was really fun. You know, you, you had you had Rock actually throwing the Smoking Skull title into that river, the same exact river where they they did it with the IC title leading up to G Generation X. And then Rock pulled off a nice swerve because he actually showed up on Raw with the Smoking Skull title around his waist. Then they did some really cool stuff with uh, Austin taking out a monster truck and running over the Rock's uh, Lincoln Continental. So, yeah, they did some really cool stuff. Plus, Shane McMahon, 
you know, got the upper hand on Austin with the, uh, there was like some sort of buried alive setup where you hit him with the shovel right before the pay-per-view. So you definitely had a lot of cool elements here. I would definitely say this, this might've been the funnest build up to any rock Austin match. And yeah, I, I don't think it was as good as WrestleMania 15. I, I think WrestleMania 15 had a much more electric atmosphere. I, I think wrestling wise, the, the WrestleMania 15 match is superior to this. But um, yeah, I, I think I think this might have been their most fun match, uh, without a doubt. I think my my only my biggest complaint is just maybe a little bit too much of the same with the um, you know hardcore stuff, kind of brawling all over the arena. You know, they I thought they spent way too much time by the uh, the Titan Tron entrance area, right by the steel fence. But aside from that, I, I thought they did a lot of fun stuff here. Probably the highlight of the match was uh you know rock actually uh stealing the uh the headset from the spanish announce team and uh after he hit the after he hit the rock bottom through a table he's like yeah rock bottom right through the table on that 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 texas trailer park trash so rock was actually in his element here he was able to get on the mic and, and talk trash and he actually stole a camera so 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 rock takes a, a camera and he's he's kind of mocking Austin. Then then he then he takes his eye off of Austin, starts looking at the crowd. The crowd starts going crazy. Then Austin hits him with the stunner out of nowhere, and the Rock is like, "Oh shit!" As he has the camera on, so it looked really cool. You know, the the, the stunner to the Rock while Rock is actually holding the camera. It, it's definitely probably the most memorable spot in the match, and that actually happened on the Spanish announce table. And uh, you know, Shane Shane was trying to screw Austin the whole match. You know, there there was you know Shane constantly sticking the fingers up at Austin. You know, shades of Survivor Series '98. Um, you know, the, the Rock actually you know, so so the Rock actually turns babyface the very next night, and uh, he blames Shane McMahon for the loss. I believe there's a spot where Shane actually accidentally hits. The Rock with the title, and uh, you know The Rock. You know, The Rock really blames Shane for that, and you know the Sh Shane and The Rock have always had great chemistry, so that was definitely the right decision. And uh, this ended up being The Rock's biggest babyface turn of all time the very next night. So that's pretty much you know th this this ended up being the um, you know what propelled The Rock to turn babyface. So great decision there. Ultimately, The Rock. Takes the stunner from Austin, I think a couple of a couple of stunners in a row, and Vince actually brings down his own referee. I believe it's Earl Hebner, and uh, kind of reluctantly gives Austin both belts. And Austin celebrates with the WWF title and the Smoking Skull title. Everybody goes home happy. Uh, but at this time, though, you know Vince is kind of uh, you know secretly knowing he's going to end up being the higher power. And that's that storyline with Stephanie. So the pay-per-view actually ends with Undertaker driving Stephanie away in a limousine. And he's like, where to, Stephanie? And Stephanie starts screaming. So I, I, I believe it was one of, the, one of the very next Raws. They were going to uh, sacrifice Stephanie McMahon. And Austin was going to make the save. And there was this whole higher power storyline where the, 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 it was like a prophet in, in a hoodie. And it ended up being Vince. And that's where Vince says, it was me, Austin. It was me all along. So this is a very... Very soap opera like, very you know, very dark and convoluted storyline. Well, I would say it was definitely creative. Um, you know, th th this was probably one of the last great things Russo booked this whole Ministry of Darkness, Stephanie, higher power storyline. And you know, the WWE Network even did a uh, I actually saw the Stephanie Evil documentary that was one that really you know got, caught my attention. And uh, you know, that that this whole storyline is what really propelled. Stephanie to turn into an evil bitch, uh, so to say. So that's pretty much, that's what you could kind of look back at this thing like. And it really, you know, I, I think the the highlight of this whole thing is just, you know, the, very important is, you know, The Rock really used the Shane situation here to turn babyface, which, you know, paid huge dividends for the co company coming into the next year. You look at where Triple H and The Rock were at this pay-per-view, that this was a very... A pivotal, pivotal time, I think, for both guys, without a doubt. So yeah, uh, the pay per view, the pay per view was pretty good. I, I gotta say, the last four matches were really good. I, I thought you got a really solid quadruple main event here. 
Um, all the matches got time. There was no video packages here. So it just felt like everything got a lot of time to really tell a story. And, you know, that you, if you were able to digest everything, you know, you, you really had enough time to really do that. Uh, my biggest problem with the show is the crowd. You know, the, obviously the crowd was great for Rock and Austin, but everything else, they felt very spoiled, uh, very bloodthirsty, very horny crowd too. Very, very, uh, you know, it, it, it just, it, they came off like the, the kind of crowd to me that just didn't appreciate great wrestling. I, if anything, I'll say, I think the, I think the crowds actually got better. I, I think when you look at the Backlash 2000 crowd, um, to me, that, that crowd was a little bit more um, positive and, uh, and a little bit more appreciative towards uh, good wrestling. So I think that's that's another thing you could definitely take away from Backlash 99. But yeah, for a 1999 show, I wouldn't say it was bad. Uh, I, I got to be honest. I got to say this is probably one of the better pay-per-views uh, of, of 1999. And I, I, I think most people would agree. It's, it's probably a little bit more well-rounded than uh, WrestleMania 15 was. So that's pretty much it. And uh, yeah.